a building that has changed hands, changed names, changed religions, changed lives. If walls could talk, this building would have a lot to say and in many, many different languages. Welcome to Istanbul's Hagia Sophia. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, please hit that subscribe button. For the rest of you, please like and comment. It would mean a lot. I promise you that. Now, before we get into this, I just want to say that this is a touch complicated and you have been warned, but let's get into it. The saying goes that Rome wasn't built in a day, but there's also another saying. Rome is too big for one ruler, and the Romans tended to agree because what they did is they decided to divide the empire in two, into an eastern and a western side of their empire. But they would still see themselves as a single unit, a single Rome, even though they would have two emperors, an eastern one and a western one. However, we as modern people and as historians have found this a bit complicated, so we have decided to give these two sects a different name, especially because the Eastern and the Western uh, empires were big enough to be empires all by themselves. So we've given the Roman Empire title to the Western Empire because it had Rome in it. The Eastern Empire got the name the Byzantine Empire because it came from an ancient Greek colony called Byzantium, and they spoke Greek there. The Hagia Sophia was built in the eastern uh, capital of the Roman Empire, and it is now known as Istanbul. But back then, it was named after an emperor, Constantine. Of course, Constantinople. Building of the Hagia Sophia started in the faith district of Constantinople, near the Bosphorus, where Asia and Europe met. And it was finally completed under Emperor Justinian I in 537 AD. But it took 177 years to build. So why did it take so long to build? Well, it was built near the Great Palace uh, in 360 originally, and it was built out of wood, like many things at that time. And, well, there was a big old riot, and it burned down. Emperor Theodosius II had the building rebuilt, and, well, Constantinople was a bit of a mad city. And let's say if you think that football hooligans are bad, try chariot racing hooligans in the 6th century, because in 532 AD, they decided to loot the city again and riot against the emperor. And, well, you guessed it, the building was destroyed for a second time. So technically speaking, the building was destroyed twice before it was even finished. When the Byzantine cathedral was finally finished, the son of a peasant who became an emperor, Justinian I, decided it was going to be the most important building in his empire. Originally, the building was called the Great Church because of its enormous size, and it got another name change after the second incarnation of the building, the Holy Wisdom Hagia Sophia. But there'll be a third name change, which we are going to speak about later on, and you'll see why I'm postponing it. When the Justinian version was finally finished, it held the record of being the largest cathedral in the entire world until Spain built their cathedral in Seville. It was built out of brick and mortar, which is Roman concrete. The marble floors date all the way back into the 6th century, and it's said that they are to represent the seas. But in 2020, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, they have been covered beneath carpet to preserve them. Now, before we go on, just let me warn you about the interior. Um, if you haven't ever seen Byzantine uh, interiors before, they loved bling and gold bling. A lot of it is in the Hagia Sophia. The upper gallery, which was preserved for the Empress and her court at that time, uh, is home to perhaps the most spectacular mosaics in the entire world. That being said, there was some graffiti found in the 60s and 70s, written in ruin of all things. And it was written by an elite guard that came from the northern part of Europe uh, who were in the Byzantine army. In other words, a whole bunch of Vikings decided to graffiti all over the cathedral. Its enormous dome is 55 meters in the air and it's supposed to represent heaven on earth. It's apparently so complex that they needed to get a mathematician, a person called the Hero of Alexandria, to come and help the architects at the time to construct the stone. 
Unlike the dome in the Pantheon, which has never faulted, there was an earthquake in Byzantium. And in 558, the dome was destroyed. It was collapsed. And in 562, they rebuilt it and they made it even bigger. Now, there's a whole lot of little domes supporting this large dome. And what I find is quite amazing is even though that this dome had just been destroyed, they decided to put windows just beneath the top of the dome, which would make it weaker, obviously. So they're quite brave. Now, what was this amazing church used for? Well, it was a place where new emperors were crowned. It was a place where political power was held for 900 years, and it was the building of the Greek Orthodox Church. In the Fourth Crusade in 1203, a guy called Alexis IV paid the crusaders to come into Constantinople so that they could make him the emperor. And, well, this is kind of strange because the Crusaders were supposed to be going off to the Holy Land and securing the Holy Land and protecting Christians on their way to and from the Holy Land. So what on earth were they doing in Constantinople? Now, these Crusaders were definitely not good people, and they decided that they were just going to be a team of ragtag thieves. So they killed this other guy and they said, well, let's just loot the city, which was a Christian city. An old blind doge in Venice, Enrico Dandolo, decided he wanted to join in the fun and he came with his army to come and loot the city, including the Hagia Sophia, where he stole perhaps the most famous bronze statue of all time. The Triumphal Quadriga, which is a set of four bronze horses. Ironically, it was then stolen from Venice and, and taken to France by Napoleon in 1797. After Napoleon's downfall in 1815, uh, it was then given back to Venice, who has it in St. Mark's Square, instead of sending it back to its original home in Constantinople. I don't get it either. For the next 50 years, the Hagia Sophia was a Roman Catholic church because the Crusaders had taken power. But when the Byzantines retook power, they changed it back into a Greek Orthodox church. After quite literally a millennia of Constantinople repelling any sieges away from their walls, they felt they would never be conquered by anyone apart from the Crusaders who they let in. That was until a little boy who was made sultan after his father had failed to gain Constantinople as part of his dominion. They made him sultan and then they realised, well, perhaps having a little boy as sultan is not such a good idea. So they brought his father back, which made this little boy a little bit angry and a little bit strong as well. When he finally did become sultan, Mehmed II would change his name in 1453 to Mehmed the Conqueror. I'm sure you've understood what's going to happen here. He used Hungarian cannons to siege the walls and get into Constantinople. These walls hadn't been breached in 1,100 years. It's said that the spirit of Mary was seen leaving the Hagia Sophia when Mehmed's army entered in Constantinople. Of course, this meant that Mehmed defeated Rome itself because we must not forget that Constantinople was part of Rome. They saw themselves as Romans, and the emperor at that time, Constantine, uh, saw himself as the emperor of Rome. After the conquest of the Ottomans, they changed the name from the Hagia Sophia to the Hagia Sophia. I know, massive name change. They also changed the name from Constantinople to Istanbul, and they changed the church into a mosque when they erected the minarets outside. Those are those big pillars outside. Strange for the time, Mehmed decided that he should whitewash the facades because he found them so beautiful, along with all the mosaics at the time, instead of destroying them and cover them up with Islamic displays instead. Many, many years after Mehmed's death, they were uncovered and they are displayed again. Well, not all of them, but most of them. Of the 107 columns inside Hagia Sophia, there's a special one, the weeping column, where St. Gregory rubbed the column asking for forgiveness, and apparently it has healing powers. Although this is still a religious place for many, in 1934, the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Ataturk, decided to change the mosque into a museum. Today, there are a number of religious sects who are asking uh, if they could please take down the Muslim displays that uh, Mehmed put up so that they could see the original facades and mosaics that are all there. But these uh, Islamic designs that Mehmed put up have a history of their own. They've been there for 600 years. This building is an amazing representation of where Asia and Europe meet two cultures, two religions, two different ways to rule. It's also proof that 
they have had turbulent pasts, but they have a common history. And let's hope that through this common history, we can realize and gain a more peaceful future. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit the links that are going to come up now. I really, really do appreciate it. Like, comment, subscribe. The more you know, 